Well, I, I didn't exactly plan it, but I'm glad it turned out this way. Today, of course, is a, a pretty meaningful day in the lives of these six young people up here. By God's grace, they've reached a certain milepost in their walk with Christ. It's not graduation, so don't be deceived by the gowns, because you don't really ever graduate from following Christ on this earth. But it is a milepost in their spiritual life, their spiritual journey, their walk with Christ. You see, they, they've reached the milepost in their life when they can be counted among those who've been great commissioned, you might say. Perhaps you recall in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, where Jesus, the risen Lord, appears to his disciples and, and he, he says to them, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Well, these six youths in our midst have been baptized into the name of the triune God, according to the Great Commission. They've also been taught the truths of the scriptures, not just to know them, but to live by them and to obey them. And now that they've reached this milepost in their Christian life, they have the opportunity in the future to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood given to us as a, a nourishing food for our faith. It's pretty common in Lutheran circles to celebrate Confirmation Day on Palm Sunday. A lot of you probably are aware of that because a lot of you were confirmed yourselves on Palm Sunday. That's a great Sunday of the year to have confirmation because, of course, if you're confirmed on Palm Sunday, that means the first time you can receive the Lord's Supper is on Maundy Thursday, Holy Thursday, which in salvation history is the night when Christ instituted this holy meal that we call Holy Communion. But if there's another Sunday that's as appropriate for confirmation in the whole year, I think it's probably this one. Because today, the fourth Sunday of Eastertide throughout the world is known as Good Shepherd Sunday. It's a Sunday when the Christian church loves to reflect on this, this meaningful, this deep, uh, this special relationship that we have with Jesus Christ our good shepherd. I didn't plan it this way, but I'm glad it worked out this way. Twice in our gospel today, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He also says, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Of course, there he's talking about us, his followers. We are his sheep. We are sheep in the flock of the good shepherd. It's a wonderful thing to be a sheep in the flock of the good shepherd. But it's very important to remember for ourselves that we are sheep in the flock of the good shepherd. You see, sheep are pretty helpless animals, actually. They're not very good at tending to their own needs. They're not very good at fending for themselves. They have a really hard time finding food and water on their own. They have a hard time protecting themselves from predators. Uh, they have a hard time having a sense for danger and, and what could be easily become a dangerous situation. If you're a city slicker like me, it might be helpful to think of uh, sheep kind of like the animal version of a toddler. If you see a toddler wandering around all by itself without a caretaker, you think, that's a, a toddler in trouble. You can't have a toddler wandering. They're going to get in, in, in some sort of danger. They need help. 
They need to be tended to, cared for. Just as toddlers need a caretaker, so also sheep need a shepherd. Spiritually speaking, we're, we're actually a lot like sheep. We can't provide for our own spiritual needs. We have a hard time sensing danger and what can easily become a spiritually dangerous situation. We're a lot like sheep because we can't fend for ourselves. We need a shepherd. And in our Savior Jesus Christ, we have exactly that. A shepherd. Not just any shepherd, a good shepherd. The ultimate shepherd. What makes Christ the ultimate shepherd, the good shepherd, is what he says about himself in our reading for today. You see, Jesus did what hired hands and many other shepherds aren't willing to do. He says he lays down his life for the sheep. He's done that for us. Christ laid down his life for our eternal salvation to win us back from sin and death and hell. He laid down his life for us, his sheep. When a sheep gets eaten by a wolf, you call that a tragedy. But when the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, you call that grace. Amazing grace. God's grace. God's grace that turns everything upside down and, and backwards. Amazing grace. Grace beyond grasping. That's the grace that makes Christ our good shepherd. The grace that caused him to lay down his life for us. But don't miss something else that Jesus says in our gospel today. He says, I laid on my life only to take it up again. See, Jesus separates himself from all of his spiritual care in this simple fact that sure, others might be nice. Other spiritual leaders might be wise in some sort of way. They might even make sacrifices. But only Jesus, the good shepherd, made the ultimate sacrifice for sin. And only Jesus is able to take his life up again. And during this Easter season, we've rejoiced in the reality of Christ's resurrection. That Christ, our good shepherd, on the third day did rise again from the dead after making atonement for our sins on the cross. And today, in our gospel, our risen Lord speaks a word of promise to us. When he says, I am the good shepherd, that's a promise. It's a promise to continue shepherding us, his sheep. From our time of being a little lamb on to life's end, Jesus puts himself in charge of our life. He's the one that guides us in the faith and that keeps us in the faith. And he tells us that as our good shepherd, he knows us. He doesn't just know about you. He doesn't just know the peripheral details of your life. No, he, he knows the sins. He knows the failures. He knows the worries. And yet he still delights to call himself your good shepherd. He knows the scars. He knows the damage. He knows the questions. Yet he still delights to call himself your good shepherd. It's his joy. It's his great joy to be your shepherd. 
This picture of, of Good Shepherd Jesus is a picture that's lasted thousands of years. And it's resonated with people for that many years and more. It even resonates with people that don't know a thing about real shepherds and sheep. And perhaps that's because, you see, in a world that's fatigued and exhausted with sin and brokenness of all kinds, when Christ comes and says, I am the good shepherd, he gives us a promise that refreshes us. That promise that I am the good shepherd is an all-encompassing, comprehensive promise of arrow-pointing down grace. That even though we stray, even though we struggle, Christ is there to give us grace. Even though we act like sheep, even though we're needy or fickle, he delights in being our good shepherd. He delights in giving us grace. So dear people of God, especially you, the six confirmands, take comfort today in your good shepherd. Know that he's there to be your good shepherd in your life. That he has died for you. That he watches over you. And he provides for all of your needs, body and soul, your whole life long. Take comfort in that fact and know that he's there, especially in those times when it seems as if he's not. Because that's especially when he is there, as your good shepherd, by your side, providing for all your needs according to his will. Rest assured as a sheep in the flock of the good shepherd, because you truly are safe in his care. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.